Chers auditeurs, Dear listeners, bonjour. Welcome in Comme d'Archi Podcast Season 3. Saison 3 dans le monde fascinant des architectes. And in the architectural projects. Je suis Anne-Charlotte de Ponte, passionnée d'architecture et docteur des universités en histoire de l'archi. I am one of the spokespersons of Anne Charlotte, who is a PhD in architecture history. Merci. Thank you. D'être avec moi aujourd'hui. To be with us today. Et And maintenant, now, lundi en français, place au talent. And Wednesday, let's talk projects. In English, of course. Bienvenue dans Comme d'Archi. Dear listeners, welcome to the second episode of our Comme d'Archi summer series on the theme Short Chronicles and Beautiful Castles. This is Estelle on behalf of Anne Charlotte. I had the pleasure of writing this episode. The Château d'Amboise an architectural mass clinging to the rock, in turn fortress, place of arms, Renaissance palace, and then luxury prison. It is one of the great names of the Loire Valley castles, residents of the Valois, who, exiled from Paris by the Hundred Years' War, became attached to the Loire Valley, palace of the kings of France during the Renaissance, presumed burial place of Leonardo da Vinci, In 1840, the Château d'Amboise was one of the first buildings to be classified as a historic monument. Some 17 years later, Léon Gozlan wrote, Wouldn't the loss of the Château of Amboise, or Chenonceau, be as keenly felt as the much more repairable loss of a bridge over the Seine, be it that of Austerlitz or Jena? And indeed, the site is historic, even prehistoric. However, although the site has been occupied since the Neolithic period, the major construction phase of the castle began at the end of the 15th century, during the reign of King Charles VIII. 75% of the castle built at that time has survived to the present day. Due to the centuries-old history of Amboise, several architectural styles are found side by side and complement each other. Flamboyant Gothic, International Gothic, Italianate Renaissance. But let's not go too quickly. Let's go back in time to the beginnings of our era. During the Neolithic period, analysis showed that the site was already fortified with the presence of an oppidum. The main city of the Turons, the Celtic people who gave their name to the future province of Touraine, was located there. The site is strategic. The Châtelier Promontory, nearly 40 meters high, is an exceptional natural defense at the confluence of the Loire and one of its tributaries, the Amas. Some local chronicles even boast of the presence of Julius Caesar and then the Emperor Vespasian. Fast forward a few centuries to 1463. The site is now a medieval stronghold where King Louis XI installed his wife, Queen Charlotte de Savoie. He had a new dwelling and an oratory built. The latter was built against the southern wall. Soon, Charles VIII, succeeding his father Louis XI, transformed this small oratory into a chapel dedicated to Saint Hubert. This work was part of a large-scale project. Indeed, under Charles VIII, who was born in the castle, the former medieval stronghold became a sumptuous Gothic palace. The best of Europe worked together on the colossal Amboise project. Innovative techniques were even developed to heat the stones, prevent them from freezing in winter, and to continue the work. The French masons and craftsmen worked together with the Flemish sculptors. Soon, Charles VIII returned from his military campaign in Italy. He was accompanied by 22 Italian craftsmen. This maestri made Amboise one of the cradles of the French Renaissance. Charles VIII had the following built. The Saint Hubert Chapel, built and sculpted between 1491 and 1483 by Flemish artists. The style is flamboyant Gothic. It is made of white tutha, a stone and chalk from Touraine. The lintel of the entrance door represents the hunt of Saint Hubert. Its plan is a Latin cross with a nave of one bay, a transept, and a choir ending in an apse. The pointed arched bays are framed by sculpted archivolts. Later, stained glass windows by Max Saint-Grand were added. They depict episodes from the life of Saint Louis. The doors are decorated with a plant motif, innovative at the time. The architecture becomes an imitation of nature. 
Charles VIII built the wing known as the Charles VIII wing, also in the flamboyant Gothic style. Flanked by high towers, the royal dwelling has a regular facade of pilasters and bays. On the top floor, the high dormer windows are topped by gables and belfries, representative of Gothic architecture. This wing includes the king's and queen's lodgings. The latter has a low gallery of pointed arches. This is characteristic of 15th century French civil buildings. Charles VIII also built the Room of the Noble Guards. It is the largest room in the castle. It controls the access to the staircase leading to the upper floor. The vault is supported by a central pillar or Gothic palm tree. The room has two fireplaces. The first, with a trapezoidal hood, is still marked by the Gothic tradition, while the second, at the other end of the room, illustrates the Renaissance style. Finally, Charles VIII had the two cavalry towers built, the Minim Tower and Urto Tower. Both very massive. These are real lifts, which allow coaches and carriages to access the castle terrace. In fact, the two gently sloping ramps rise from the tone 40 meters below. The Minim and Urto towers are located on the north and west facades of the castle, respectively, and are of Renaissance architecture. However, the spiral ramp of the Minim tower, with its ogival vault and stereotomic principles, seems to be a consequence of the Gothic aesthetic, stereotomy being the art of cutting and assembling pieces. Nevertheless, it has a new dynamic of formal arrangements. Thus, if in the first base the keystones remain Gothic, they are then adorned with the transalpine taste. The aesthetic boundaries gradually fade away to give way to a new synthesis. The façade on the Loire is monumental. The new construction achieved the fusion of the old taste, medieval France, and the new spirit, Renaissance Italy. The design of the royal residence bears witness to the mastery of the last architects of the flamboyant Gothic style, corner towers, pinnacles, high windows, etc. However, the application of the Gothic style of cathedrals to a non-religious building bears witness to the beginning of the innovation of the Renaissance. At the same time, the Italian decorative vocabulary can be found. For example, the façade of the Queen's dwelling features statues in the Italian style, which symbolize a theory of virtues. Two innovations in particular mark an important stage in the history of the relationship to the landscape. The façade of the royal residence is clad with a metal railing, a first in France. The light modern nature of the railing allows the view of the Loire to be admired from the interior of the Grand Salle. At the end of the 15th century, Don Pasello da Marcogliano designed the Naples Terrace. It is a Renaissance garden with three belvederes overlooking the Loire. Three windows open onto the landscape. The medieval walled garden is no more. The feudal fort has been transformed into a Renaissance palace, which now has 220 rooms. In 1516, Leonardo da Vinci, 1452-1519, joined King François I and his court, who had moved to Amboise. François I had a floor added to the angled wing known as the Louis XII wing. The high dormer windows bear witness to the Italianate taste. In 1620, Louis XIII builds new defences. However, afterwards, due to lack of maintenance, the castle gradually deteriorated and some parts were gradually demolished. Between 1627 and 1660, the main buildings of the Western Wall disappeared. In 1793, we lost most of the castle's decoration, panelling, fireplaces, statuary, painting, ironwork, carpentry, etc., when the castle became a prison and barracks for veterans of the revolutionary armies. Between 1806 and 1810, the owner, ex-consul Roger Ducrot, was unable to finance the complete restoration, although the work was carried out at the expense of the Senate. He preferred to destroy two-thirds of the building, notably the Collegiate Church of saint Florentin and the Queen's lodgings. He thus transformed the castle into a country house in the Romantic style. Finally, in 2005, a beautiful addition was made to the castle. 
It is the Oriental Garden, designed by Rashid Kouraishi in honor of the Emir Abdelkader's companions who died in Amboise during their captivity. Today, the Saint-Hubert Chapel is closed for works until the end of 2023. However, it is possible to discover the traditional techniques of the ornamentalists, stonemasons, carpenters, stained glass artists, etc., who work on the chapel in accordance with the rules of art. Let us conclude with the words of Gustave Flaubert, published in Par les Champs et par les Grèves, 1847. The castle of Amboise, dominating the city, which seems to be thrown at his feet like a heap of small pebbles, at the end of a rock, has a noble and imposing figure of a fortified castle, with its large and thick towers, pierced by long, narrow, round-headed windows, its arcaded gallery, which goes from one to the other, and the tawny color of its walls, made darker by the flowers which hang down from above, like a cheerful plum on the bronze forehead of an old soldier. Dear listeners, thank you for tuning in. Let's meet again next week for a new Summer Come Darchi in English. And until then, take care of yourselves. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Thanks to Julien Robourg, sound engineer, who is collaborating with us today. Don't forget to tune in to our previews on Instagram at Comme d'Archi Podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, don't hesitate to promote it by giving it five stars and a little comment on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast platform. And above all, subscribe to listen to all of our episodes for free. See you soon, and until then, take care of yourself.